let's get into the, the big topic of open source. Something that we actually say right. right. This is so we awesome. Are an open culture that it, it's actually in a big piece of that process yeah. that a developer or let's say a As the Kubernetes ecosystem really boomed. Welcome to another episode of In the Clouds. I am your host, Stu Miniman, and wow, we have reached August 2023. Uh, before we get to uh, our wonderful guest this week, I, I just want to a big thanks uh, to the technology community. Uh, this last weekend, I participated in a charity bike ride. It's known as the Pan Mass Challenge. You might notice, uh, you know, up on my wall there is the PMC flag. It's the fifth year I've done this event. Uh, it is very well known, uh, you know, in the Northeast and many around the country know it. it's the largest charity bike ride in the United States. Um, I did a two-day 162 mile bike ride. Uh, it was the first year that I had done the two day. I had done uh, a bunch of one days in previous years. Um, it was uh, inspiring. It was tiring, um, and it was really good. Uh, I've raised about eight thousand dollars. Want to give a uh, huge thank out uh, to uh, plenty of my work colleagues. I had people from Red Hat, from VMware, from AMD who donated. Uh, those companies do company matches, uh, and it's awesome there. Uh, and, uh, you know, hey, next year, uh, if you're interested in finding out more, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, we'll put a link uh, in chat here. Uh, anybody that wants to give any last minute donations, those are open. Uh, 100% of all the donations go to the Dana Farber Institute, uh, which is a wonderful uh, organization, uh, that the nonprofit that does uh, cancer research, cancer support. So, really, really important uh, event that I am, uh, you know, really happy uh, to be able to participate in. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, let, let's switch gears. Uh, we have uh, have a wonderful guest uh, this time. I'm happy to bring on the program uh, Matt Butcher. He is the co-founder uh, and CEO of Fermion. Uh, I'm sure many of you in, in the cloud and Kubernetes space have heard lots of buzz uh, about uh, WebAssembly, WASM uh, technology. Uh, and those of you uh, in the container industry uh, might remember Matt uh, from so some of his uh, pr previous work. Uh, he's been pretty crucial in some, some awesome technology uh, that we still leverage uh, you know, in, the, in the containers and Kubernetes space. So Matt, uh, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it, it, it's great to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. So Matt, maybe if you could, you know, I, I, I tease a little bit, but, uh, you know, Helm charts, Deus, you know, give, give our audience yeah. a little bit uh, of, of your background. Yeah. When, when my career started, I was really more focused on content management systems uh, and, and ended up working at HP in a brand new unit there called HP Cloud, uh, originally to do the CMS system that ran the developer docs. And I, as soon as I got a taste of cloud computing, I was just all in. So I switched from CMS into sort of the early OpenStack work, uh, worked on platform as a service and OpenStack. And that really sort of redefined my career. And I got going right into the cloud world, uh, ended up a few years later at Google. Uh, and then uh, after a stint there, uh, started at Deus, which is a small open source oriented company in Boulder. We were building a platform as a service on, you know, at the time, this brand new technology that was so exciting. It was containers, right? And nobody else was building a PaaS on that yet. And then along came Kubernetes. Uh, we decided to replatform our PaaS on top of Kubernetes. Uh, that required us going really all in on a technology that at that point was like 1.0, 1.1. Uh, and so we built a package manager for Kubernetes called Helm uh, and really got very involved in that ecosystem. That caught the attention of Microsoft. Brendan Burns had recently gone from Google to Microsoft and was interested in building really a top tier uh, Kubernetes team. And so Deus got acquired by Microsoft. A bunch of us uh, became sort of like the open source Deus Labs team inside of Microsoft where we were. Uh, I, I had what I think was the best job ever, right? We were doing upstream open source all the time, going to all the conferences. It was just a lot of fun. Uh, sometime in there, we started looking at, uh, you know, what might be the next generation, the next wave of cloud computing and what kinds of things would sort of sit alongside the virtual machine and container ecosystems that had already taken such deep root in the cloud ecosystem. And, uh, and that got us looking at, you know, the kind of the serverless style workloads, things that needed to start up and execute really quickly, you know, go from start to finish in milliseconds instead of running for hours, days or months. 
Uh, and that ultimately led us toward WebAssembly. A group of us left Microsoft back in 2021 to found Fermion, really focused on building this kind of next wave of cloud compute. And our team's grown over the last couple of years. We're about 30 now. Uh, we do a lot of open source work upstream inside of Bytecode Alliance and CNCF and W3. And then, uh, you know, building Fermion the company. Yeah, uh, it's awesome stuff. You know, I, I remember, boy, the the the, uh, the the excitement around the community, around Helm charts. Uh, it was funny. It was one of those things that just sticks with you, Matt, is certain announcements get really excited. Um, and it was the first time uh, that I remembered uh, something getting removed that got everybody excited when they got rid of the tiller uh, yeah. know, on Helm charts. <laughs> the whole place just erupted and was like, yay, thank you. And it was um, like, um, yeah, somebody built that originally and we thought that was the right architecture, but absolutely we need to make changes. But, uh, you know, it's yeah, usually useful. Yeah. Uh, you know, gosh, you know, I, I, I think about, you know, we, we, we still leverage, you know, on the Red Hat OpenShift side, uh, things like HashiCorp Vault, uh, you know, or, uh -huh. uh, you know, use Helm charts. And that's how we uh, put them into the uh, OpenShift uh, e ecosystem there. So hugely important. Yeah. Thank you uh, to that crew. Um, so if you could, 2021, you started Fermion. Uh, WebAssembly has been around since, you know, it was announced in 2015. It launched in yep. 2017. Could you... For our audience, just give us a snapshot. You talked a little bit about services, yep. and, you know, things, but what is this WebAssembly thing? How does this fit into this ecosystem of kind of the apps and, uh, you know, containers and VMs and everything, what, you know, the yeah. web browsers, you know, WebAssembly itself? Yeah, uh, we could go all the way back to like 1996 to start that one, right? Oh, when boy. Java was first invented and, and inserted into the web browser, the idea was we would have this full featured programming language and JavaScript was a little kind of dinky toy language that you use to kind of wire things up inside the browser. And uh, Java, of course, took off in its own right in a very different direction from what everybody thought it was going to be. Uh, but applets, Java applets inside the browser, they sort of faded and, and fell along the wayside. And several other attempts were made to insert additional languages into the web browser with, you know, Silverlight, with uh, Flash and and each kind of had its day in the sun, but none of them sort of proved to have the longevity that the, the tech that we kind of hoped, right? Um, when the Mozilla team in 2015 decided to take on this problem anew, they basically said, we've made a couple of mistakes along the way in this idea of embedding a programming language environment inside of the browser. The first one is every single time it was proprietary or supported by just one or two vendors. And the second one was we were always bringing a very specific language and saying, you know, this is the language you can use in the browser alongside JavaScript. And uh, and, and so this effort began uh, first with Mozilla, and then they quickly joined forces with, uh, the, you know, the Chrome team from Google and the at the time, the IE team from Microsoft, the Safari team from Apple, and said, let's build a standard platform agnostic, uh, you know, OS architecture agnostic, language agnostic runtime. Uh, that can go in the browser and that can just, instead of doing all the UI stuff initially, let's just figure out how to solve the core compute stories. So we can, you know, give those old C libraries new life by compiling the web, web assembly and running them in the browser. Uh, we can add some high performance or support some high performance languages like C and Rust and, and Go and be able to have those running inside the browser to complement JavaScript. A uh, great example of this in practice, right? Both Adobe and Figma use WebAssembly in their online graphical tools. You know, Figma being a good example of a high-speed vector drawing program that you have in the browser. Uh, when you can compile C++ to WebAssembly, you can do very quick vector math and then be able to interface with that, those libraries from JavaScript. So that was really kind of the original vision. Us, you know, coming from, at that time, Microsoft and looking at serverless as the big problem, we're we're looking we were looking at something very differently right we did not start with webassembly and say is there an application in the cloud we started with this problem statement and the problem statement went something like this we need a cloud runtime that can run serverless functions really well what are the problems we hear from developers that they want solved with serverless functions first one is startup time you know amazon lambda still even today 200 to 500 millisecond cold start time we were looking for something in the 10 to 20 millisecond cold start time 
Uh, you know, we needed the cross-platform, cross-architecture. You know, to really realize the idea of serverless, you can't really be telling developers, if you develop it on Windows, then you're going to have to run it in a Windows serverless environment. If you develop it on Linux, you'll have to run it in a Linux serverless environment. We really thought we could do, you know, find an environment that would be more amenable to this kind of cross-platform thing. Uh, and then developer experience is a big deal to us, right? We, we just felt like the way, and we were at Microsoft, so we were, this was an act of self-criticism at the time where we were going, we're asking developers to keep keep cobbling together very sophisticated systems and we're just inserting functions as a service as one more piece that they have to you know, string together uh, all the way through all the services. We need to figure out a way to make this developer experience really, really streamlined. So we started looking at technologies that we felt like would be good for that. Uh, and, and, you know, we played around with, you know, very stripped back virtual machines and, and unikernels and, and, uh, and we tried out uh, a number of kind of low level runtime technologies, but ultimately WebAssembly really bubbled up to the top. We looked at it and said the security profile that, that you need to run WebAssembly in the browser is almost identical to the security profile you need on the cloud side, right? It needs a strong sandbox isolation model. That's really, I mean, that's really important. We think, think about how much you trust your web browser <laughs> to protect you from dastardly things that could be done by bad actors on the internet, right? That level of security was the same kind of thing. So that checked the biggest, most important box. But then as we got into WebAssembly and the cross-platform, cross-architecture, in nearly instant startup goals that the project had. It was just one after another. We were checking off the checkboxes on our wish list for this kind of cloud runtime. Uh, and that's, you know, ultimately what drew us to it. And then what, what, as we began to experiment, every single experiment was confirming for us, yeah, this is the right technology for it. Yeah. So, so, so Matt, uh, it's interesting. I think of some of the parallels, you know, Docker didn't create containers, but they really helped, you know, bring it out to the masses and, and make it there. Um, your team didn't create WebAssembly. Help me understand, you know, what what is the why and kind of the the the, the core capabilities that you know your team have, um, and kind of the vision that you have of you know what yeah. you take that existed and you know where, where it will go from there. Yeah, the Docker analogy is so good because I think. Uh, if Docker Docker managed to cut a couple of years off of the adoption curve, that's the standard adoption curve, and they did it in a fascinating way. Uh, they had an operations-oriented technology, and they convinced developers that developers that they wanted to use it. Right. And, and, you know, operations teams are much happier when the developers come to them and say, we'd like to make, you know, the operational experience easier for you because it's easier for us on the development side. So we really, you know, we borrowed liberally from the Docker playbook in that sense and said, you know, um, the first time I ran through the, the Lambda Hello World example, it took me 47 minutes. I actually timed it. Uh, and, and we thought that is just that is a hard developer experience to sell. You know, you want a developer to be able to sit down at the end of the day on Friday and say, I'm, I've got some time to learn something new. Uh, what, you know, what's out there that I can learn? The last thing you want to do is have them frustrated because of all the little steps they need to take to get Hello World running before they can really uh, experiment with it. And we, we said, okay, that's, that's a hurdle that we can take on, right? Can we, can we make the developer experience so good for serverless applications uh, that they can do it in, oh, I don't know, two minutes. Let's get them to Hello World in two minutes. So that became sort of like a, a crucial story for us for our first year as Fermion was, as a developer, I can get from a blinking cursor to my first deployed application in two minutes or less. Um, and that, that we thought, okay, then we have a chance at articulating our actual value prop, which is we can run faster, we can remove a bunch of uh, road, road, uh, speed bumps in the, in the road to getting your application deployed, uh, we can run cheaper, uh, we can run cross-architecture, cross-platform, all of those stories really take a little bit of um, uh, experience before the developer understands the benefit of them. But if we can just make the developer experience excellent, right, really awesome, uh, then people will be will try it out and say, oh, well, just for this, I would like to use it. That I think is essentially what Docker did, right? Yes, you could build containers if you had, you know, four and a half hours to start assembling your 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 container and and, and get it all, figure out how you're going to package and distribute it. Or you could write a Docker file in a couple of minutes and then have something that was easily shippable and easily executable and testable. Uh, and that that you know, it was it was great that you pointed that out because I think. Uh, Docker's biggest contribution to the container ecosystem was showing how easy it could be for developers. And that's, you know, the kind of thing we want to do with WebAssembly in the cloud. Yeah, absolutely. So um, quick aside, we actually got a, a, a comment from the audience. Um, they, they, 
after your thoughts on Gollum Cloud, um, they, they said was it was makes it possible. I'm not real familiar with it. Um, it's, it's, it's something about you know decentralized uh, you know computing uh, and the like. But uh, if, if that's that's one you can answer. Yeah, I mean, and you'll see you'll see a number of of attempts to figure out what parts of WebAssembly we can leverage. Uh, Gollum hasn't been totally, you know, they, they've got a couple of blog posts and, and uh, I think it's still a closed source uh, solution at this point. But, uh, you know, part of what they're looking into is whether or not you can freeze and unfreeze WebAssembly modules. And this actually gets to a very interesting point about WebAssembly itself. You know, as a bytecode, a stack oriented bytecode format, uh, you can do some very interesting things because you've got the you encapsulated sort of the entire running unit in one, one nicely snapshotable stack. Uh, we played around with this at Docker with Docker for a long time too, because Docker is very similar. And there's been this idea for a long time that it might be possible to freeze, move, and unfreeze a Docker container, right? And I think there's a lot of interest in the WebAssembly community in general in that same idea. Can we freeze, uh, move, and unfreeze a WebAssembly module? And the same issues that came up with Docker are going to be the same issues we, we run into with WebAssembly. If you open a socket, and then move something over to another server, you might move the binary, but you, you you also have to figure out a way to move, to make it look transparent to the binary that the socket that you were on over here is open over here. And same with hardware layers and all of that. Uh, one very fascinating thing though, one very fascinating application of this, and we use it with JavaScript and Python and .NET. The, the first stage of any interpreted language is to sort of load all the source into memory, you know, parse everything, load everything, and then you start executing. So when we looked at this, uh, there's a great project from uh, from the Bytecode Alliance called Wiser, W-I-Z-E-R, uh, that, that allows you to sort of make an init step and then freeze your WebAssembly binary back out. And so, uh, you know, with, with something like a JavaScript runtime, you can load all the JavaScript into memory, uh, snapshot it as a WebAssembly binary and ship the pre-initialized one. So for some of these systems like .NET, Python, and, and JavaScript, you can actually, TypeScript for that matter too, you can actually speed up the startup time over a sort of native implementation because you can preload a bunch of stuff right up front. So, uh, you know, I think Gollum, several other people were looking into, uh, us included, we're all kind of looking into what can we do with that kind of snapshotting ability? Uh, what you know? What are the limits uh, to which we can push it? Gollum's got very aggressive limits. Uh, we we tend to take a very pragmatic approach because serverless functions are our primary focus right now, and we know those aren't going to last for days, months, uh, days, weeks, months. Right? Those are going to execute in set milliseconds to minutes. Uh, and so snapshotting a running application is less attractive to us than some others. But it's cool to see that work kind of happening in the ecosystem at large. Okay, so so Matt, help us understand a little bit. You know, we're talking a lot at kind of the the application runtime. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned Lambda. Uh, does it mm -hmm. does, does what you're working on work with any serverless? Does that bleed into kind of the container in container serverless things? You know, or VMs left out in the dust? Uh, you know, what, what where where do you fit with kind of the that infrastructure layer uh, that many yeah. of us deal with? Yeah. So. At the core, what we wanted to build was a was a set of developer tooling and a runtime for serverless applications. So what does a runtime look like for a serverless application? A, a serverless application is an application in which you, the software developer, do not write the server code, right? The thing that stands up a, 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 a process, listens on a socket, manages the interrupts, all of that kind of stuff. Instead, a serverless application is one where your application code takes a request or an event, handles it, returns a response, and shuts down. So again, you're looking at the lifespan of a serverless function being you know, milliseconds to maybe 15, 20 minutes at the top end. Right? So a very short running piece of code compared to a server, which is designed to start up and run for hours, days, months, you know, and so on. So by focusing on just building that piece and that spin um, in Fermion's spin open source project, uh, we can provide uh, the runtime for a serverless environment. WebAssembly happens to be the best binary format to execute these kinds of things, but that runtime can then be portable across a wide variety of environments. So Fermion Cloud, for example, runs inside of AWS. We use the entire HashiCorp Nomad stack to, to run everything. Nomad's such a flexible scheduler that we had. It was a weekend project to write our first draft of a scheduler for WebAssembly. 
Um, but there, we also support Kubernetes, so you can run inside of Kubernetes alongside containers. Um, so uh, the Run Wazzy project that's inside of Containerd allows you to run WebAssembly side by side with containers. Um, and and you know we're working with Red Hat, we're working with others to all the different make sure all the different kind of flavors of low level container runtimes can also support low level WebAssembly execution. Uh, and then you you know you can run it locally. You can run it uh, inside of Docker Desktop. Docker Desktop supports this. In each of these cases, really all you're doing is saying, okay, uh, all we need to do is is map the idea of executing a very quick serverless runtime to the idea of being able to schedule and route traffic into this particular uh, environment. And so to that end. Our goal is to make it possible to run this in just about any kind of cloud environment, any time, type of IoT environment, and locally. Okay. Uh, you, you mentioned the Fermion cloud. Uh, so is help us understand uh, kind of the open source project versus, mm -hmm. you know, how you productize, you know, what monetization uh, does Fermion have? Yeah. And it, it breaks it easily into a two-part story, right? Uh First of all, how do we build these kinds of applications? Spin is an open source tool that allows you to, you know, very, very rapidly build a, a new WebAssembly based serverless function. So you basically type spin new, it'll scaffold things out for you. Spin build, it'll build it into WebAssembly. Uh, spin up, you can test it locally. Spin deploy, it'll push it somewhere else to, to run it. Uh, and we support, we have top level SDKs for JavaScript, TypeScript, uh, Python, uh, Go, Rust, and we're adding more languages as we go. But basically any language that supports the standard called WASI, which is one of the W3 standards for WebAssembly, we can execute those inside of Spin. Uh, so Spin is the open source, really the core of everything uh, that we do. And uh, and you can actually go take a look at the at the source code at github.com slash Fermion slash Spin and kind of dive into your heart's content. It's all written in Rust. Uh, but we needed a place to run these kinds of applications. Uh, so we built a reference implementation called Fermion Platform that just takes a Terraform and installs, it can install into clouds ranging from you know Azure and AWS to Sivo and Equinox and wherever you kind of want to run your thing. Um, that, that was kind of a reference implementation to show how one might run it in production. But we wanted to provide you know, one layer on top of that and say developers want the easiest possible way. And this is a big thing for us. How do we give developers the easiest possible way to do X? The easiest possible way to deploy your app would be, hey, I just type spin deploy and it pushes it out to somebody else's managed service uh, and, and I can you know, log into my dashboard and manage it from there. Fermion Cloud is that. Right, it's a developer-oriented uh, hosting platform that allows you to, with one command, deploy out there, and then you can log in there and map your domain to it, and wire up some databases and and whatever you need to do to, to take that thing from sort of like the idea you've got locally into a production environment where you can run it for everyone to see. Wonderful. Um, yeah, no, I, Matt, I, I appreciate how you uh, you know kind of explained all that. Um, do want to you know give a mention? I know your team will have a big presence at WasmCon uh, September sixth, seventh, uh, happening in Bellevue, Washington. So uh, you know Seattle, a great place to go uh, for these things. And yeah, it, it, it's one of those because WebAssembly it's been around uh, for, for you know a number of years, but. Boy, I remember like a year ago, the buzz on it um, was really, really high. Um, yeah. Expect, you know, a, a lot of companies there. And it's not, you know, one company that that's driving this technology. There's a pretty big consortium. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned a couple, you know, we've definitely, I'm, I'm sure we've got folks from Red Hat side. I've been hearing, you know, uh, yep. you know, some of our people that work, you know, on, on run times down at the operating system uh, that are pretty excited. We've written a couple of blogs uh, on how this fits into the overall thing that we'll be doing. Yeah. So yeah, good. The, yeah, the, Red Hat. Red Hat was one of the founding yeah. members of the Bytecode Alliance. Yeah. Uh, they have been a tremendous influence in the WebAssembly ecosystem now, sk spanning years, right? And and it is WasmCon's really cool. We should give a shout out to the fact that CNCF has gone from you know a kind of pre day thing, the Wasm Day, that was really oriented around how does WebAssembly work with with uh, existing cloud native technologies to now. Uh, a multi-day conference that's designed to be open and pull in a lot of people from the other other areas of, of WebAssembly, right? There's still a huge number of people who write browser-based browser, browser -based applications. There's an increasingly or very rapidly growing tooling uh, environment. And when you think about... Uh, what, what would be the weak link in the WebAssembly plan right from the beginning? Well, the weak link in the plan is, yeah, it's nice that you can have a runtime that can run any language, but you actually have to get every single language community out there to support your binary format. And an event like WasmCon is a great place to bring like, 
you know, representatives from the Python community, the Kotlin community, you know, the Swift community, all of these different programming language communities, uh, you know, into the same room to talk about the same problems and, 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 you know, yep, solve Matt, them. If I again. remember right, I believe RustCon is also co-located, uh, you it know, with, with the event. So yeah. that, that'll uh, definitely, you know, bring in people there. So definitely yeah. Uh, yeah. check that one out. Uh, yeah, CNCF, lots of events, really cool stuff. Um, of course, I'm sure uh, there'll be a lot of that bleeding into uh, the KubeCon show uh, happening at the beginning of November also. Uh, you know, I know Fermion was there. You and I got to speak, uh, yeah. you know, a, a year ago at the, at the KubeCon North America show. Um, awesome. Hey, Matt, um, you've got uh, Fermion Beyond, Fermion Cloud, Spin, uh, the open source project, um, recently had an announcement about a no-ops database, uh, I believe key value uh, was, the, was, was the discussion. So help, help our audience explain a little yeah. bit um, about the, the recent announcements and you know, where you're expanding your offerings. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for us, again, going back to that, as a developer, I can go from blinking cursor to deployed application in two minute story. You know, that was our first year. We got to the end of that year and said, okay, uh, we can do that, right? Uh, our C CTO, Radu, is very proud of saying, it's actually 66 seconds now. I can go from blinking cursor to deployed. Um, but we started saying, okay, well, what are the other kind of speed bumps that are frustrating or annoying or uh, that developers could self report they could live without, right? And one of them was setting up a local environment that matched the production environment. And another one was wiring up services, right? Essentially an operational concern that many developers find themselves having to take on and become experts in something, or at least uh, you know, proficient in something that they really don't have any interest in. So we, we listened to that feedback and we said, okay, is it, would it be possible to just sort of remove some speed bumps out of that developer path? And, and what would be the first and easiest one to do? and decided that the easiest one was one that we learned firsthand in the early Kubernetes days, right? I, I remember as I was writing my first Kubernetes apps, right? I was one of those people who was like, hey, everybody, the future is stateless. Your application should not have any state in it, uh, you know, and, and, you know, shouting from the rooftops along with many of us who were early in that, in that ecosystem. At the same time, wondering in the back of my mind, yeah, but I need to store state somewhere. Where am I going to store state? I mean, <laughs> got to, it's got to persist. Um, and so, you know, and, and of course, in the Kubernetes ecosystem, we learned how to operate databases inside of Kubernetes. And, and that story has long since been solved. But we thought as we got going on this developer speed bump thing, can we remove that speed bump? Because serverless's big advantage is that you can scale from zero instances to tens of thousands of instances instantly and then back down to zero as soon as all the requests have been handled. But that the, the the way to do that is because every one of those functions is stateless. So nothing's keeping state request over request. So rolling out a key value storage system was the first and easiest step for us. Let's just make it easy to store key value. The, the API surface is tiny. Uh, so we built a, a local version into spin, where if you're running spin, you declare, I need key value storage, and instantly it's just there. You don't install anything. There's no processes to manage. It's just part of spin. When you deploy to the cloud, we wanted that same exact experience there so that I do a spin deploy and something somewhere else in Fermion Cloud provisions me a key value storage system that I never have to worry about at all other than to write my API calls to get and set and things like that. Um, that worked out really well. We were, we were surprised at how quickly and how... Uh, how quickly users adapted it and then what positive feedback we got back about it because it was just one thing they didn't have to worry about. Writing stateless apps felt like writing stateful apps because everything was just happening at the API layer. We realized along the way it's actually a better security story too because there's no risk of credentials or tokens leaking. There's no risk of, of TLS certificates expiring because all of that is happening in the host runtime of WebAssembly and doesn't bubble its way up to the user land. Uh, we got such great feedback about that that we went, okay, well... What's next? Uh, relational database. And uh, we already had a local SQL Lite database because that's what we were using for key value storage. So we just said, okay, well, can we provide a highly distributed in cloud SQL database that uses the SQL Lite API or SQL Lite dialect essentially? Um, and make it so that you have that same no-op story between the local host where they just have it and a deployment out into the cloud where they just have it. And, and again, there's no connection string management, no TLS management, no user management, nothing. It's just a database that's there and you can start writing selects and inserts. Uh, so we partnered with Terso, um, uh, who had been working on a distributed SQLite flavored database. And, uh, and rolled that out only a couple of weeks ago. And again, you know, we're really early on that one, but still the feedback we're getting has been really overwhelmingly positive that this is just one less thing the developer has to worry about. Now, very quickly, 
not all developers are going to be happy with the built-in version of it. It's great for writing quickly. Many people will find it great for running on for the entire lifespan of their application. But some people will want to have their own database and manage it or their own key value storage and management and, uh, and manage that. And so as we built this, we said there should be a clear, easy way for a developer to declare or for an operations team to declare, hey, instead of backing this key value storage to the built-in one in Fermion, back it to a Redis database, here's the Redis database over here, and inject that as config into the application so that they have an opt-out. Same is true if you want to use Postgres or MySQL instead of uh, SQLite. And we're excited about that because it feels like we're starting to make the right division between the developer concern, help me just write my code as fast as possible, test it as fast as possible, and get it deployed without a headache. And the operational concern, which is, hey, from day two on, this thing has to be rock solid, has to fit in with our security profile, has to match our operational considerations. And I, I feel like we're taking kind of those first steps toward being able to make that distinction clear. Awesome. Well, uh, Matt, you know, I'm a little surprised. We're 30 minutes into the call. You were just talking about some of the challenges uh, that we're seeing on the developer side. We have not talked about generative AI at all. So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you've got series A in. I'm sure by the time you go to the next time, you've got to have that mentioned at least, you know, uh, yeah. every paragraph that you mentioned it in here. But uh, no, in, in all seriousness, you know, I remember back, you know, a number of years ago, it was like, Docker, 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 like everything that we talked about, you know, Docker was uh, in the tech space right now. Generative AI is all of the discussion, uh, not only in yeah. the tech community. Matt, I said it's one of those few things that like normally when I, you know, get family gatherings and they're like, oh, yeah, Stu works on computer stuff. Maybe they know I do cloud stuff, uh, yeah. things like that. But they're all playing with chat GPT and some of the th things like now. So help us understand a little bit. You know, generative AI, is there a play? Does it tie into, you know, what you're doing, what you're seeing? Yeah, and I, I think you were totally right about the the magnitude of the impact of generative AI. I mean, it reminds me of when my, you know, parents discovered the first websites, right? Yeah. And they're going, hey, can I go to this WebMD place and look up, is it reliable? Am I going to get good information out of this? And and now we're, you know, we're seeing the same thing with early AI where uh, my, my kids know how to use it. My parents know how to use it. Everybody asks me, when is it taking over the world? Uh, and sometimes they mean that in a good way and sometimes in a bad way. Um, but it's a, it's a really exciting um, moment, right? And, and once more, it's, it's super exciting to be in an industry that at this particular epoch of human history is like... The, the, the innovation curve is just so fast. Uh, so and, and the bottom line there is, yeah, we all have to know about AI, right? AI is not, I think there was a, for many years when we talked about AI, we were talking about it as a problem that there would be a, a, a specific class of engineers. They would be AI developers and they would be, you know, doing PhDs in this stuff. And, and uh, we would hand off work to them and they would be able to do the work and give us back meaningful results. And for a long time, it really has been that way. And when it comes to the core of what's happening in machine learning and what's happening in neural networks, yes, th those people will continue to be, to be the ones who are driving the innovation. But when it comes to using you know, large language models and, uh, and, and using generative AI tools, I think that's a full stack developer thing already, right? I think in, in a matter of months, we saw it go from specialist to uh, everybody needs to know it. And that means that we're on the cusp of a set of tools that need to be developer friendly, that need to be easy enough to pick up and include in your tool belt alongside knowing how to write SQL, knowing how to use a key value storage, knowing how to use a cache, knowing what a proxy is, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, WebAssembly seems to be peculiarly well positioned in this case, right? Because the core value prop, one of those first things that drew us to WebAssembly back when we were looking for what this candidate next wave of cloud computing would be, was this idea that we needed something that was gonna be operating system neutral and architecture neutral. Now at that time, I was naively thinking only in terms of CPUs, right? right? Should be able to run on ARM, should be able to run on Intel. But the technology that you know the the WebAssembly community as a whole has constructed runs in such a way that GPUs are no different, right? Or even running a workload on a GPU, switching it to a CPU and back to a GPU is all of that can be done transparently, where the user doesn't the the, the developer who writes the code needs to know nothing about any of that. They just need to know, hey, when I write this inferencing stuff against this particular library it's going to run in the environment where I go and maybe it'll be slow when I run it locally and it's consuming my CPU. But when I deploy it remotely and it's running on an A100 GPU, it's going to be a lot faster. 
developers understand that trade-off and very much appreciate the fact that they don't have to think about it. So I think WebAssembly is going to be one of those core technologies that in many ways blossoms because uh, by pure happenstance, it was addressing one of the problems that, that uh, you know, the, the sudden burst of energy in the uh, generative AI space has indicated is actually a really important problem to solve. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to the next, you know, year, as I think we'll see a lot of um, generative AI oriented tools that come out of the WebAssembly space and, and think it'll be a really good area of growth here uh, may in fact be sort of the killer use case for WebAssembly in the cloud. Awesome. Well, hey, uh, Matt, we actually, we did get another comment. I think they were uh, listening to what you were talking about, the NoOps database and the, uh, and the key value store. And they said, how does it integrate with other cloud services? So the idea with Spin uh, is that Spin itself should allow you to connect different backend services into your WebAssembly host runtime in a way that is transparent from the perspective of the, of the developer's code. So the developer is writing code, it compiles to WebAssembly. WebAssembly is a neutral format that runs in all these places, but it runs inside of a host runtime. And the host runtime does two things. It executes the bytecode instructions, right? But the other thing is it can inject, uh, uh, essentially inject APIs directly uh, into, into user line and say, hey, you can run this call and it'll do this kind of thing. So that's how we do database, right? Uh, we expose the database layer through the host uh, through the host. And then when you're writing code, you're writing against an API in WebAssembly and the host is doing the work of translating your inside code to whatever needs to run on the outside environment. Uh, so in that way, then, as long as you can standardize the interfaces along that host boundary, uh, then everything becomes portable. Uh, so WASI, the WebAssembly system interface, is this whole idea that we should be able to write system interfaces, right? that talk between WebAssembly, a kind of pure format, and whatever the system provides. And so WASI is sort of like the linchpin that brings these two things together. The practicality of that means that when you take a host, a WebAssembly host like Spin, uh, you can plug in different backends to that. And in some cases, it's a configuration. You know, if it's something that we thought about and support already, like databases, then yes, you can just plug in your, your MySQL database configuration here or your Postgres database uh, information there. In other cases, for more exotic things, it's the kind of thing where you actually have to write the, the host plugin. Uh, there is a big specification working its way through W3 under the auspices of Bytecode Alliance, who does all of the writing the specs and then doing the reference implementation. This spec is called the component model. And the component model describes a very, um, a very clear way, almost like gRPC style, like a uh, way of articulating what a host provides and articulating what WebAssembly modules provide. And it allows you to sort of build up and expose different services in, in new and interesting ways. That will streamline this whole process. Uh, WasmCon, I expect this to be the number one story at WasmCon is what are people doing with a component model and where is it going from here? Because it's such a powerful unlocking technology for us to building applications that frankly, we've not been able to build before because there just wasn't a technology analogous to this. Yeah. Uh, all right, Matt, uh, la last question I have for you. Th this space has been changing really fast. Uh, g give us your, your outlook. What do you expect to see kind of the next six to 12 months? So there are about three different work streams that I think will really come to fruition. The first one is there are a whole bunch of add-on specifications to WebAssembly that are working their way through W3. Uh, garbage collection is one. When the garbage collection thing lands, then a whole bunch of other languages will be able to port over very easily because they won't have to bring their own garbage collectors. You know, there are all kinds of like low level things like that where some incremental improvements in the specification will sort of amplify out through many, many programming languages, communities, and many uh, capabilities. Uh, second one is the component model that I just talked about. Uh, that really, that one redefines the way we can create applications, right? That we can build sort of these aggregate applications and it unlocks a really interesting use case. And that is, imagine being able to take a Python library, compile it to WebAssembly as a library, right? And then write some Rust code that imports the functions from the Python library. And then maybe it exports a couple of other functions. And then you can write a JavaScript function that calls into the Rust library. And you can start, the language is no longer relevant because they're all bytecode, they're all the same bytecode format. And they have this kind of standard way to expose imports and exports. And when that happens, I think then we really start to open up some potential where things like you can use NumPy from TypeScript and you can, uh, you know, 
pick your favorite parts of Go and use them from inside of Rust just by exposing these different components. That'll be a big game changer. And then I think the, the third and last one is, uh, you know, we're, we're going to see a lot of languages moving. I, I've been trying to sort of diligently track the language ecosystem. Rust and C moved right away in part because Rust moved alongside the specification and C was the target language. But now we're seeing JavaScript, Ruby, Python, um, .NET, all of those are maturing. And then sort of this last wave of languages like um, like Java and Objective-C and languages like that, I think are starting, Dart, Kotlin, are all starting to build up some gravity and momentum to, to support WebAssembly as a compiled target. All right. Well, Matt, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Uh, last, uh, you know, bonus question. Uh, tell us a little bit, slash the cat, um, because, you know, <laughs> Docker had Moby. Um, and I, I, I'll tell you, uh, it's a nice T-shirt. Everybody always likes it at, at, at the conference uh, to grab one of those. So, uh, yeah. How do we end up with Slats the Cat? Slats the Cat is a real cat. Uh, Ivan on our team has a cat named Slats. During the, uh, during the pandemic, the cat suddenly developed very, very picky eating habits. And so Ivan, you know, would feed her a, a can of cat food, you know, open it up and give her a spoon in the morning and she would just devour it. Then he would go back to give her the same thing later in the day and she would not eat it at all. And so he'd take another can out and open it up. And this cat was just so finicky. Uh, and so he kept a spreadsheet on his fridge, just trying to track and see if there were any patterns. At one point, he, I called him, you know, in our one-on-one, -on -one, he said, yeah, I went to the pet food store and bought one of every kind of canned cat food to see if there's any pattern at all to what she wants to eat and what she didn't. So when we created that finicky whiskers game, uh, you know, it was originally sort of a joke on, on, Slat, on Slats or Ivan's cat. Uh, and then Slats has sort of like taken on a, a life of her own. And uh, we all wear the t-shirts and, and love the Slats character. And uh, finicky though she may be, uh, she's also really adorable. <laughs> Awesome. Well, hey, a cute story. Always love, uh, you know, bring the real life uh, into what you're doing. So uh, Matt Butcher, um, yeah, there's, uh, if you see this last comment, uh, thanks guys for the amazing job you and your team's doing. Uh, really great to catch up with you. Appreciate you sharing uh, with our community uh, what's happening. Uh, wish you the best of luck at WasmCon. I'm sure uh, our teams will be crossing paths with you. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks again for having me. This has been a lot of fun. All right. And thank you to the audience. As always, uh, please feel free to reach out if you've got uh, guests, topics that you want to cover. Uh, summer's a little slow. A lot of people are on vacation. So I apologize for not hitting quite the regular biweekly cadence, but uh, definitely lots of uh, cool things I'd like to do in the second half of the year. Uh, so uh, until next time, I want to thank you. I'm Stu Miniman, and thank you for joining us on your journey in the clouds. Thank you.